<laughs> Not for posterity. I see. Okay. Got it. Well, I want to say thank you very much for the uh, warm welcome I've received here. I appreciate it very much. The um, Fiction Collective uh, was my first publisher back in 1981 with uh, the book Heretical Songs. I started helping to run it around 85 through roughly 98 or so. And uh, so I very much appreciate uh, your efforts to keep uh, that worthy cause alive. Uh, it was very interesting to go back into the archives uh, here and, and look at all the books that uh, I once had so much to do with. I was, uh, I was happy to think that uh, the books had held up so well and that, that they had uh, a lot of future to look forward to. A lot of readers to look forward to. So, um, the uh, as you may have gathered, I, I have had two careers. Uh, one was uh, the first career was as a postmodern fiction writer, and the second career was as a culture critic. And there's a long story that kind of goes into how that second career happened. But uh, I'm, I think I've been very fortunate in that in that regard, uh, and um, I've enjoyed uh, both aspects of the writing that I've done. Um, what I want to read to you today will be fiction. And uh, um, it will be from, because I haven't, it, the last seven years it's just been Kurt White, Mr. Culture Critic, you know. Uh, and so I haven't really had much of a chance to think about uh, little, uh, the fiction that I've already written, let alone writing new fiction. So this is a great opportunity for me in order to kind of go back and say, what stands up? What would I like uh, to, to read to you uh, from uh, work that all feels kind of curiously distant at this point. <laughs> but um, So I'm going to read to you from uh, a, a book that uh, is called the, the Idea of Home, uh, still in print with Dalkey. Um, and uh, it's a book that was first published by Sun and Moon Press in LA. Um, but in the life of a writer, or at least in the life of this writer, uh, there is a certain pattern, I think, for most of us. There are the pure learning books, or the pure learning works, where basically you don't know who you are or what you're capable of, and you're just sort of trying to discover. Those books inevitably are the books that you're most embarrassed by uh, later on, and uh, I am embarrassed by my first two books in particular, although there's, I think, still some very good things in them, um, heretical songs and uh, metaphysics in the Midwest. But it wasn't until this book, which I wrote from 88 to 91 or so, somewhere in that area, um, that I sort of discovered what I wanted to do. I discovered the, the aesthetic idea that I wanted to, to create. And uh, even there, though, um, there was a certain, certain kind of learning process. Once I'd figured out who I was, what kind of book I wanted to write, and you know, what kind of voice I wanted to use, uh, there was still a learning process. So this was my first attempt at the book that I was meant to write. And another funny thing about being a, a writer, at least, is that you, know, you, have, you write all these books, but sometimes it's all the books are written just to get at this one book, just to do this one book right, completely right. Um, and so this was the this was the first, and there there were three attempts at it, and I'm very happy with uh, with this book, because it is because it uh, I, I make my idea work here for the first time, but in two subsequent books I made it work even better. Uh, the the second one was Memories of My Father Watching TV, um, and then the third one that just got it so completely right that I said, well I'm done with that, uh, I have to have to I reinvent myself. Uh, which I haven't managed to do yet, and that one is Requiem. But the idea basically is uh, to write a highly architectural book that doesn't have a unifying plot, but that is nonetheless highly conceptually designed. It is completely thoroughly, it, there's nothing random about it at all. It may look random to you, it may feel random to you as you're reading it, um, but there's nothing random about its architecture, its structure, its form. Um, but it's a it's a uh, a novel of pieces, you know, 
So there are lots of individual pieces that are sort of all over the place, but then the architecture of the book itself kind of brings them into a certain kind of, of coherence. So that was the idea that, uh, that I wanted to create. And the other thing that I wanted to do in these books was I wanted them to be functioning in sort of the playful postmodern tradition, but I also wanted them to be deeply human. And this is something that my, my dear departed friend David Wallace and I um, uh, shared. You know, we wanted to do things that were, that were uh, formally ad adventuresome and experimental, but in the end, we wanted them also to, to, s to speak in a very human way to our audiences. So this particular book, The Idea of Home, is a, a begins as a, as, a, as a novel about that place that I grew up, which is a suburb of, of San Francisco called San Lorenzo. It was a, a vet village. In other words, it was like Levittown West, they called it. So a place where you had a lot of prefabricated stucco homes that were all looked more or less the same. And, but it was, uh, it was the first home of a lot of returning veterans, of which my father was one. Um, and so it started out as a book about that. Uh, it then bec its ambitions became larger because what I became interested in was the idea that this prefab uh, suburban thing um, was on the site of a certain kind of history. And that history had been completely obliterated. So it, especially obliterated was the presence of Indian uh, Native American populations and, and the original Mexican uh, uh, you know, inhabitants of, of California. So, but there were curious little signs that they'd once been there, like all of this, all, even though this was a totally white, lower middle class, middle class suburb, all the streets were Spanish, you know? And so it was, a, it was a sort of mystery that didn't occur to us or to me to be a mystery until much later when I said, yeah, why, why did they have all of these uh, Spanish names? For, like I, I grew up on Villa and Deta, uh, you know, so. Um, why did they have, uh, so that those names became a kind of clue to me that, that there was a, a history beneath the surface that was being uh, forbidden to us. And so this book is a lot about uncovering history. And, uh, and this particular book, uh, I think you'll see uh, this story, this particular chapter, um, it is particularly about that process of uncovering the surface in order to find out what's beneath. And uh, it's called uh, Dig Here and You Will Find a Writing. And so there, it's narrated by this guy um, called uh, Silkman. And uh, there, it's punctuated by these little invocations, sort of like there was some sort of liturgical thing or a ceremonial thing, right? And uh, so every once in a while, you'll see me go, invocation, and then I'll move into this completely strange voice. But uh, there, are little, there are little ways of punctuating the story. So it begins with an invocation. Woe to he who will crush the senseless worm that crawls at evening in his pathway. The story I have to tell took place during the reign of the legislature of a thousand drinks. I, Silkman, probably works well in Texas, doesn't it? Up in Austin, a legislature of a thousand drinks, right? I, Silkman, an aristocrat of cards, a high-toned sporting gentleman saw it all transpire. I understood it now as clearly as your AC Ducey. I should have understood it then, since in my incomparable Beau Brummel waistcoat, I had the ear and the confidence of every fat man on that august legislature. But it's too late. It is a hundred years too late. I can only tell the tale now, and that only if I have time, for my bowels flee from me. They dissolve from the far side and flow from the near. My intestines mistake themselves for a fuse. That much it sizzle I can feel. The far margin of my intestine turns to dust and falls into the funnel. I am my own hourglass. The black grains pour from my fundament like gunpowder from its keg. I sit in a corn crib in the shadow of 
Mount Diablo, an actual mountain in the Bay Area. I'm pure friction. I'm a live wire. Touch me and we all go. The devil's quaint volcano as well. They have drained the swamp in which I have kept my gaze for the last 50 years in order to, de to develop houses. The whip-like rushes, the truncheon blooms of the tools are brown and dead in this sort of swampy area. 20 bulldozers, earth movers, dump trucks gun their engines and will not stop. I think they are bug husks. Invocation. Obliged to speak. All plots to kill, the threatening demonstration of a dog's bark, arsenic in his medicine, laudanum in his coffee, chloroform on his pillow, several blows of a hammer on his head, heavy dull blows with the axe, more dogs developing. Silkman, your professor of cards was handsome. Observe his patent leather, high-heeled boots, that costly diamond breast pin Observe the dainty diamonds on his fingers, sparkling withal. He was cordial, bland, and fascinating. Even his toys were serious. He carried a derringer, pint-sized death. On its ivory grip was inlaid lapis lazuli. On the one side, a bloody hand, hearts a-flushing. On the other, a twofold dilemma. His countenance gave an advertisement of intellectual power, calm, reserved power. There was no mercy. He surely crushed the senseless worm that crawled at evening in his pathway. I am Silkman. My body is this history. My body is deep with time. I keep to myself in these tools as a courtesy. I'm too profound to be looked at. For if you were to gaze at me, I might gaze back. Therefore, those bulldozers work at risky revelation. Sleepers awake. Give the bright eye of the sun but a moment to look on the ground cleared of the thoughtful tools. You know a tool, T-U-L-E-S, they're like those uh, in the tulies, the, you know, in, in the marshlands. And it will be obvious that the loblolly pattern in the hardened mud is the crisscross of bone on the top of my cranium. Dig there on top of my cranium and you will find the book of memory in which is the writing. Thus, in our beginning were the Akalanes, copper-colored people of peculiar habits. This district was infested by hordes of these creatures. The legislature of a thousand drinks set their fine tables up on that breastwork of hills yonder and made their important judgment, quote, and that, I take this quote actually from a history the, uh, the most incredibly racist history I've ever seen of uh, the of the of a, uh, of a county, Contra Costa County in California. The general expression of the wild Indian is indicative of timidity and stupidity. The men and children are absolutely and entirely naked, and the dress of the women is the least possible removed from nudity. In February and March, they live on grass. Clover and wild pea vine are among the best kind of their pasturage. We have often seen hundreds of them grazing together in a meadow like so many cattle. They are the descendants of Nebuchadnezzar. They live to die. I made up none of that. Invocation. Oh, you far removed race, you swarming infants, you who consort with death, you more willing to submit to kindness than Negroes, your great disposition for extinction puzzles our dull brains. Your aptitude for cholera occupies the studious mind. When the Akalanes vanished before the overwhelming tide of civilization, the world was rid of so much filth. But the dozers working for these slim housing development boys raise a tide that is itself filthy. The dusky vaqueros, that race half-caste of Castilian and Indian blood, might have been a clue if I'd had any notion, any comprehension of our precarious character or the threat in our success. For this, too, is the place where the swart vaquero, your buckaroo, once rode with a jingling spur and bit and yakima and snake-like lariat. He, like the eternal sporting gentleman, wore his clothing as if it were color, purest desire, splashed on him 
His trousers were laced together at, to the knee with bright ribbon, run through eyelets and fastened with silver bell buttons. He had a pink sash at his waist and a colorful serape over all. None of the comely Bruins of that race ever gave these hombres the pumpkin. <laughs> I forget what that means. Uh, <laughs> but it was a phrase I found somewhere, giving someone the pumpkin. <laughs> at the end of the rodeo season, the middle of May, the matanza, the killing season, began. And so from the legislature of drinks, down would come riding that one fellow designated as the judge of the plains whose duty it was to inspect brands, stoop to catch the confession of each singed calf, arbitrate disputes, create disputes where there were none, steal as many hooves as he could for the slight sake of the le legislature's greasy union, and determine the number of cattle to be slaughtered. After the butchering, the hide was taken off the beast's wheezing corpse and dried. The tallow fit for market was forced into bags made from hides, the fattest portion of the meat was made into soap, while some of the best was cut, pulled into shreds, and dried in the sun. The rest was thrown to the dogs, thousands of which were kept to clean up after a matanza. It was the dogs, finally, who were the frailty and the vaquero seamless logic of meat. The dogs gave the secret away, for even in those parts of the year distant from the matanza, blood clung to the vaquero's boot heel like memory. And so when he rode into town, tall, luminous, a string of the curs followed at his horse's heel, urgent. It was for this reason that no vaquero was allowed entrance to my gambling saloon. For the saloon was a splendid parlor, fitted up and decorated in glittering style. I grant you we were dependent on the vaquero and blood, but we were blood's pure, transcendental form. We couldn't be contaminated. We couldn't have the dogs howling in the parlor. And so even if the vaquero's gold was heaped in hillocks on the tables all around, even if his buxom woman, her brown pelt garbed in our gods, was reclining in our love seats, he at our swinging door, I stopped cold. Let him gawk, a protest I could meet with a little bullet between his black eyes. After all, there was no mercy. We occupied all the Christian seats and all the synagogues. We were irrepressible. We then white newcomers. Invocation. O oh, you of supple mind, you immune to guile, live like a madman beyond all limits. Go wherever you please, for the on others only live to die. From the lonely date that coxswain John Gilroy and his comrade, Deaf Jimmy, deserted Her Britannic Majesty's ship, the good man of war, prodigious duty, and established themselves in San Isidro, the Spaniards and their polluted descendants, the vaqueros, were doomed. The Alvarados, Castros, Martinez's, Sepulvedas, Estudios, Moragas, Briones, Sonols, Sotos, the Peraltas, Altamorenos, Amadors, Marandas, Berriesas, the Pachecos, Bacas, Albisos, and Naviagas, all these grand old families, each family under the rule of their kind old patriarch, all these rich, extravagant, confiding, simple-minded, old, fangled, dead people, oh, perfidious England, you're no virus, but confronted by just one of your issue of your cult, the happily dreaming Spanish legions were impotent and irredeemable. However, as the industrious legislature of a thousand drinks sagely maintained, this business is complicated and needs deft handling, for there was a far term, a ladder bracket on the Spanish destiny, which was, as we are all too aware, the termination of the national amusement of that amiable people of cherished memory, the bullfight. I want to make sure I leave time for questions. Um, so I'm going to skip the stuff on the bullfight. Um, as I said, I have lived my protracted life in this shed in among the tools, the antithesis of my spangled career as your estimable prof professor of cards, as a courtesy, a kindness to all. For believe me, I do not jest. I am an abyss. Only the wanton boys who take the shortcut to the public school know of me. They call me fart. And hey, F you. They bang the ritual stones off the side of my crib. Some of the wiser of them, the little fellows usually, who will be betrayed in their turn, call me Father Time. Now there they have me, because I did father time. I got time by a squaw of bloodthirsty character named Anistaba. 
I remember her head was covered with gashes self-inflicted, which when I touched my lips to them sent steam into the very air. It's from that moment you may date our cosmos gliding on its well-greased track. So there's more danger in clearing this last patch of marsh in creating a foundation for yet another suburb than is easily seen. For when the job is done, I shall have to step forward, my various organs fastened like a soldier's medals to my jacket. And the good people of noble, savage court or ha happy hunting condominiums will be given the understanding that their bodies are not solid like rubber. They, too, are implicated in time's bloody spectacle. When they gather round, when I see the childish faces of those telecommunications experts, those genies of the information industry, those silicon hotshots and their impoverished families in too much pain to know how to feel it, I'll tell them this story, invocation. Oh, you who took the A train, you who praise rapid transit, you who think of space and time as impediment, listen to the story which comes to you on this rat's breath. Mothers, tell your children, there is one vice common to you all, a love of the game. Once upon a time, the story comes to me now, as vivid as the sheets of newspaper, the Oakland Tribune, which the bay wind applies to the side of my shed. I remember a large, muscular female who sprang, quick as thought, upon the back of the sheriff. I remember the red hand of murder. I remember a people among whom violent death ran. And I remember a wild-looking place, a lonesome locality where many lawless characters prowled. And there across the dusty street was my own establishment, the Change of Heart Saloon, the original diamond in the rough, a shiny thing. On the night I have in mind, I arrived at a gloomy hour on, on horseback. I came through the swinging door and saw that events had been waiting for me. They had need of my eyes. You may recall, this was the Chinese year of the pistol. January 19, 1877. Four men stood around my finest pool table. They'd been grinning and chalking their cues for several hours, awaiting my arrival. Behind each of them were bags of freshly minted coin, an outrageous scene, flagrant as a skull through which the brain protrudes. But I was as cool as that sporting portion of the community I represented. I went behind the bar, poured a shot of whiskey, and said to my barkeeper, Mr. O'Brien, you may put down your shotgun for he was a faithful, nervous son of Ireland. I know these men, and know them I did. One was that same Leon Castangau by name of New Orleans, a freshman, a Frenchman, expert at billiards, jovial and convivial, but he'd once killed a man by biting off his thumb. Then that most desperate hombre, Soto, wanted on some days for the murder of Ludovici. He was large, powerful, with long black hair, large eyes of an in undefinable color, an almost tigerish aspect. Then the biggest grinner of them all, a Chinaman, low key, who had once mutilated one of his fellow celestials for reasons that were so narrow, so difficult of access, that his bewildered jury was obliged for acquittal. And finally, an Indian, Wampet, alias Figaro, a drunken, brawling, besotted fellow of whom the less you know, the better. They had the pool balls ready and racked, so from beneath the counter I retrieved a small black box. I brought it to those gentlemen as if it were an engagement ring for my beloved. I opened it, and there, sitting like an enormous pearl, was our peace, peaceful cue ball. Humming a little tune I picked up from a Norwegian fellow, I placed the ball on the table. I expected someone to say, let the game begin. Instead, little Loki himself said, I'll have a man for my supper. It was that kind of night. It was decided that these four gents would play a tidy game of eight ball, Loki and the Frenchman against Soto and Wampet, winners take all. Their host, the consistent Professor Silkman, deducted a modest charge for his services and blandishments. They drew cards for the break and Wampet chose the ace of clubs, black but not necessarily de deadly. He picked up the lucid cue ball daintily, and I noticed the gray earth beneath his nails. With a ferocious thrust, he sent my pearl into the rack, and the ball scuttled like sea creatures, obliquely ar about the table. The eleven ball staggered to the corner pocket and collapsed into that space. So Wampet kept his turn, 
He took a step back and chalked up. He faced his enemies and said, Do you want to kill me? No, said Loki. Yes, said Castengo. Suddenly the youthful French fiend slashed the unfortunate man in the face with a knife. A scuffle ensued and the Indian Wampet was stabbed in the left side. I ruled that Soto would be allowed to take up his partner's turn. Soto, the noxious, fatty perspiration standing on his face, stepped to the table, but not before placing his black revolver on the rail beside him, hammer cocked. Although I was not at that moment, I ought to have been reminded of a certain famous resolution of the legislature of a thousand drinks. How often they admonished us of the uncertainties of life. How often they reminded us that the apparently solid self was only energy, only the sun's light through a crystal. All things they were determined to show are frail, ever poised on the brink of collapse. This insight might have been of great consolation to our sporting friends, Soto et al. Later in the evening, when Castango lay dead, a bullet from my own Derringer embedded in his forehead's bony plate, a bullet from Soto's enormous pistola at home in his belly. But that time, by that time, Soto was only modestly better off. Blood spurted in a nice, even rhythm from his left wrist, and he was obliged to take his messy shots with one hand. Only low key remained whole, but his smile was some degrees sickened by uncertainty. A wee half hour later, Soto was drained and dead be beneath the table, and low key was prostrate and bleeding himself, a scythe blade in his hand, a scythe blade wound frowning over the rim of his brow. Their game had reached this point. The eight ball clung to a whisper of felt, suspended above a side pocket. My motherly cue ball muttered to it, moments away, dead on. Well, it was closing time anyway. So I took my walking cane. Yes, the one given me by the noted desperado Tiburcio Vasquez. And perching a slender hip on the table, drove the eight ball home. Backspin hopped the cue ball into its master's coat pocket. I then summoned Mr. O'Brien and had him collect the clutter of coin. Sadly, finally, to sad low key, I came and peered into his sooty face. How now? Not dead yet, puppy? Hast thou still something of the quick about thee? A little bubble rose to his lips and popping said, I win. One old mole. Yes, you take the prize, you do. Bless me if you don't. Need I say that their bags of coins sat in the vault of my bank next day, where for years they garnered dividends, financed speculations, underwrote fine ventures, and finally accreted cell by cell like a tumor? Invocation. Oh, you adventurous voyagers, you who spread yourselves over a country that seemed to suit your tastes, you who cultivated farms, established vineyards, erected sawmills, then actually sawed the lumber and did a thousand other things that seemed natural to you. You have manipulated the world and gained satisfaction. You have gouged chaos out and put an eyeball in its place. I know that some of you may think that my story is the result of a disordered brain. No doubt. I am past my prime. But in my time, I have been a leader, <coughs> enticing young Californians up the broad trail, concluding in distinction. I have practiced the seductive arts for the good of my kind. The rest of you can go hang. Still, I am sorry to see the last of these wetlands, the last of these covering tools, join the dead. It reminds me that success is a form of loss, a form of disenchantment. The gorgeous feather tools, in my judgment, have helped soften this fact. Now a fellow, one of my own blood, a native Californian, climbs down from his bulldozer. He points to me for his companions. They stop their enormous bug husks, which pause, rattle awkwardly. I rise, my legs thin like an egret's. The corner posts of my shed shiver from, with the damp and cold and begin to collapse. This is the the present past. It is deep time. The heavy machine operator approaches me timidly, a styrofoam cup of coffee, a vexed peace offering, outstretched. Sadly, I must report that the solicitous look of dead people 
was in his eyes. No doubt he'll wrap me in his own jacket and seat me like a child in the cab of his monster. He'll offer me a glazed donut and a thermos of his violent coffee. That should get the heart rushing, like in the old days. A hurricane, oh boys! Then I'll rise agitated as one of your hysterical sisters, voluminous as a demented house guest in whose head a vessel has popped. Out of that rupture will rush a dismal welter of memory. What a riot! Then I'll start talking, and I'll tell everything I know. Thank you. As you can see, I'm one who, um, uh, as a fiction writer, dotes on the, on the music of language. To me, it's almost as important what it all sounds like as, as uh, the story it's telling. Although, I'm also a kind of fiction writer who loves the simple story, sort of like with, the, with the, uh, that, that pool game there, as fantastic and surreal as it was. Um, uh, and I, I kind of got that love from for the, the kind of gem-like short story from reading the great Italian writer of the uh, late Middle Ages, um, Boccaccio, the camera. So, quest questions? Um, I'm awfully glad you paused during the reading and said, I don't know what this means. <laughs> <laughs> because when I read memories of my father once, Uh, can you expound a little bit on the book? I, I, I know uh, you talked a lot about a lot of the old black and white TV shows that you enjoy. But you took them. A little surreal. Right. Yeah. And uh, two part thing here. I noticed in here uh, the insertion of the father. Mm -hmm. And there was almost a real hate. Um, uh, yeah. yeah, one story begins uh, in Memories of My Father Watching TV. It begins, my, uh, my father was a pontoon bridge over a narrow French river. <laughs> and he was serving the Nazis. And this was all in a, uh, a story about the television show Combat, which some of you may remember. I think all of these, all of those shows are sort of somewhere on TV still, in TV Land or Nick at Night or something like that. Bonanza. Paladin, Have Gun, Real Travel, Maverick, all of those cowboy shows that I watched with my dad uh, when I was growing up. Um, the, the, I'm, I mean, there is something always sort of surreal and dreamlike uh, about my work. There is, uh, 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 it's, it's part of an effort to both tell the truth, um, but insist that, that the truth is not to be found, actually, in the straight ahead kind of realistic way that if you want to know the, the, the truth of the scene, that you have to kind of come at it in, from another angle. Plus, it's just, for me, at least, uh, a more natural and a lot more fun way to write. But the, the book, uh, from a serious perspective, is, is about the television as a great social experiment uh, in which you know, suddenly, one day, every American household had a television in the middle of it. And once it was there, it sort of took the place of the family hearth, right? And so we had the, this glowing TV rather than a, a fire to gather around. And, um, and of course, it became the family medium. That is to say, you couldn't actually, at least in my household, um, talk to anybody uh, without having sort of to, to deal with the fact that the TV was on. And uh, so, you know, I mean, if, if you started talking, someone would say, be quiet, I can't hear the show. You know, go in another room. So I was looking at, I was looking at the ways in which um, the television set uh, became part of the family and the kind of changes uh, that it, both, of, you know, because I have a lot of affection in some ways for those old TV shows. Um, but, uh, but a lot of the uh, social dysfunction and unhappiness and, and, uh, that came out of out of that as well for the first televisual uh, generation. And I assume it's still pretty much the same, although I don't know. 
Uh, you had, there's a lot of competition now I mean, with the computer, et cetera. I did another book that was sort of, that was more about having to live your life uh, online, uh, and that that's requiem. Um, so um, the um, yes, it, hate. No, I don't think there's any hate in the book. There is anger in the book. There's 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 a lot of pain in the book, especially in the part of the of the uh, boy. I think his name is Chris, isn't it? Usually, I usually give my alter ego the name of Chris. Um, and uh, you know, for me, the book was. It's also, it's also a book about depression. Yeah, it's also a book about it's also a book about depression. Um, and uh, you know, sort of my trying to create. You know, I mean, one of the things that people are asking now sociologically is uh, why are Americans so unhappy? Why do they take so many psychoactive drugs? Why, do they, why is Prozac is, you know, like taking a vitamin from so many Americans? Um, so one of the things that I'm doing is, is, is relating uh, the problem of uh, depression to uh, TV and to the fact that, that, that that families didn't have a human relationship to each other anymore, or not, not certainly wasn't what it was, not in my household, not in the 50s in suburbia. So that's sort of the book's interest. The, as, for the, um, as for the stories themselves and their sort of surreal playfulness, um, that, uh, you know, it's funny, uh, all of my work has this sort of uh, dialogue going on between this balancing act between the playfulness and the fun and the humor of, of the story and the, the sort of grim realities that it attempts to address. So uh, most people, when they read my work, say it was very funny and disturbing. And uh, I sort of like that, uh, actually. Um, that seems right to me. Uh, that's sort of who I am. Uh, so I. Uh, that's sort of who I am. Exactly. Yeah. No, that's it. That's my little joke. Uh, my my little joke on the reader. If you go, I, actually, this is very funny. If you go to uh, Amazon and look under the readers' uh, reviews uh, for this book, you'll see one of them. That, uh, there's only six, I think. And five of them are like five star, what a wonderful book this is, type thing. And one of them is a one star. And he says, my 28-year-old daughter gave me this book for Father's Day because she knew that I really like these old TV shows. And I, and I read this book, and I have to say that I didn't understand one thing that was going on in this book. And he, said, he finally says, if you like, some, uh, if you like a weird experience, read this book. But if you want an, uh, a plot to follow, then don't. I'd say get a different book. <laughs> I, I forgot to look to see whether or not uh, any other uh, Amazon browsers had found that review useful. You know, <laughs> 19 out of 20 people found this review useful and didn't buy the book. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, yeah. You never know how that's going to break. Um, but uh, you know the way um, the the way I think to read my fiction is not to fight it and uh, and just sort of let it happen. And then uh, you know if you feel like it, you then you can uh, you can go back and sort of wonder what it was all about. But I try to I try to create a kind of uh, fantastic in, in the in the literal sense of that word. Uh, and comic experience that kind of carries the reader along and then dumps the reader out at the end and saying, wow, what was that? What the hell happened? It's Professor Silkman, oh, what? He's hiding in a crib and there's, uh, you know, and then, you know, I, I mean, uh, the, 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 the literature that I uh, respect is, is stuff that, you know, rewards multiple reading. So I am very conscious of sort of the, of the seductive aspects of literature, where I have to sort of deliver a little pleasure pill to my reader, and I'm very happy to deliver a pleasure pill to my reader. But but the, then there are also aspects of the work that um, ask the reader to, to do some work. 
and that's up to you, you know, whether you, you want to go back and, and sort of look at it and say, I want to figure out what, this was, what was happening in this story. But uh, it's not realism, you know. Uh, it's uh, sort of in the playful tradition of, uh, of the avant-garde of uh, Tristram Shandy and Rob Lay and the Cervantes. Thank you, Bill. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. Yeah, how does surreal become more surreal than, than reality? Well, I, I think of sur surrealism, uh, the way I think about surrealism is that it's a, it's a response to a cultural situation that expects you to act conventionally. So to me, surrealism isn't really the issue. I don't care if surrealism survives or not. What I am concerned that that survives is, uh, is a kind of op oppositional voice of the arts, you know, that are, is constantly providing experiences for people that is outside of their ordinary experiences. So you know, you're, you are, all of us are pretty much creatures of our culture, right? We've been internalized by that culture. We, you know, the way we dress, the way we eat, the way we talk, the way we do everything. All of our expectations are very much culturally bound. But they're neat, uh, so that's what some people call ideology, you know. And there's this, there's this sort of neutral good sense in which we need a, a cultural context that we can anticipate, that is stable, that we know what's happening next, you know. Like I know we go to a reception next, okay. Uh, that's good, I understand that. <laughs> uh, but there also needs to be a kind of utopic function and that utopic function kind of com comes from art. And that, that, I mean by utopia, not a place that we're going to get to, that we're going to throw out the bags and sort of say, oh, finally we're here in utopia. Utopia, it, for me, is a conceptual place that's outside of what we expect, that, that, out, that is outside of our comfort zone, if you will, uh, of, uh, as being sort of creatures of our own culture. And um, for me, art provides that. And surrealism is a part of art that provided that outside. And it's only from that outside that we can look at what we have and judge it, whether we like it or don't like it. So what, you know, by talking about the suburbs of San Francisco in this fanta fantastic way that I do, I, 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 I get you to stop looking at the suburb as something that's somehow inevitable, necessary, always been there, and make you think about the history that it sits on, right? And in order to do that, I have to do. I have to. I have to pr perform a certain kind of violence to both language and to the way that we think about place, that way that we think about home, uh, and uh, that violence sort of opens up the space in which we can finally become sort of like uh, the philosopher Wittgenstein imagined a, a fly in a bottle who wanted to know what the bottle looked like. And so for me, the job of the arts in this utopic role is always to try to create a place outside of that bottle so that we can, we can look at it and judge it and decide whether or not it's what we want for the future. So art is necessarily socially always functional. It's never just an entertainment. It is always obliging us to look at what we have. And it, al it also is providing a kind of, of dynamic. It is also providing the opportunity for and, and uh, uh, the anticipation of change, as Barack Obama says. <laughs> the arts is change I can believe in. Yes? Pet. That's my, uh, that's my uh, little macaw, Albertine, uh, named after a character in Proust. Uh, she's also what my wife and I refer to as one bird too many. <laughs> yes. If, as you said, the product of our environment and the input we get, it seems to me that your unique perception of, of the world and your outlook, that the whole world would be broader. Oh, yes. Isn't that lovely? Does it just become too much sometimes? It would seem to me it would just, just be just bombarded because there's so much weirdness in the world. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, to me, it's, uh, it's uh, you know, it's happy making because uh, I'm, ne uh, you know, literature likes trouble. You know, literature. Uh, uh, the philosopher Hegel once said that history's happy days are blank pages. 
and uh, so so uh, li literature and the arts like trouble. You know, they like they 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 actually in a perverse kind of way uh, uh, enjoy uh, the fact that things are not perfect. You know, and. Uh, I don't know about any revolution oh, yeah. on the horizon, and I, sp I certainly don't believe any politician believes in one. Uh, they're not in the revolution business one one bit. Artists are always uh, are, are artists are always sort of um, organic revolutionaries, but but they're not a didactic revolutionaries. You know, they're not like saying let's go down and bomb this building, but they are in the they are sort of anarchic in spirit. Uh, if uh, in insofar as they're perfectly comfortable with the idea of taking apart the present and rearranging it. Uh, the philosopher Frederick Nietzsche had this great metaphor of what art does. It says, he said, art builds a sandcastle, wipes it out, and builds another. So there's that, that, that kind of pleasure in the idea that uh, nothing, nothing is permanent. Everything is sort of for the moment of creation for that human feeling of being alive and, and, um, and uh, uh, that that process is more or less permanent. So it, it's a, a, kind of, a kind of permanent revolution within the arts, a kind of conceptual revolution that the arts provide. And the, the sad thing is to think that, um, you know, that the arts in this country have been so entirely taken over by the tawdry, you know, by Hollywood or by TV or by the junk that's on the internet. Uh, or by whatever, you know, that uh, well, you know, Grammy Award music, that, uh, that the arts don't really function. They've just all been turned into this sort of self-replicating profit machine. And um, I, I've personally, you know, growing up in the 60s in the Bay Area when psychedelia and the hippies and all kinds of countercultural things were going on, um, uh, and also in in sort of the larger cultural scene in the United States with the number of writers and the excitement in books, the number of, of really important uh, filmmakers and musicians uh, that were going on at that time. I mean, the world just seemed like infinitely rich in art at that time, and, and in a way that it doesn't to me now, but that could be just me turning into a, an old grouch. And it happens. Curmudgeon. Lots of people call me a curmudgeon, which I resent. Because I'm not interested in being a curmudgeon, I'm, I'm interested in, in actually being as lively and playful as I can be. Yes? Yeah, no, that's a good question. You know, uh, I usually start books uh, of this kind, you know, that are, are, are architectural but made up of a lot of little parts. Um, I always start these books, and when I'm in the middle of them, I always feel like I hope this never stops. You know, I just want this to go on because I'm having so much fun making this up. But at a certain point, you know, and it's kind of an intuitive point, I, I have to say, "Crap, I'm done." You know, I don't have any more ideas, and everything sort of has a place, and the whole thing looks pretty much finished to me. So I must be done. And I, I, I have occasionally made the error of trying to push it. You know, so that I could continue writing it, just because I liked the characters in it or the situation I was writing about, and those are always <coughs> disasters, and I always have to go back and throw them away. Um, but uh, it's it's a pretty intuitive thing for me, at least, you know, knowing when I'm done, because it, um, sometimes you know I can put like a little story about the like the pool table story here at the end of it, and then I the, the chapter is done when the story is done, but. Uh, Sort of, there's a little coda on the end, but um, for this kind of fiction writing, it does depend a lot upon intuition, and and that's something that comes out, you know, uh, an anti-classicism, right? I mean, the classics, the cl classicism always argues that there is a perfect form, but the romantic tradition, which I think I'm part of, always uh, argues that you that everything is intu intuitive, sort of like Ralph, our own Ralph Waldo Emerson and his homages to to the powers of intuition. So um, that's that's just sort of where I, I I live, and you know, in many ways, though, I'm simply a product of of the, of the time and place that I grew up. Uh, I grew up in the 1960s in the 
San Francisco Bay Area, and I fell in love with hippies and psychedelia, and so that I sort of kept on that line, you know. And I still like the playfulness and the sense of being alive that 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 moment in time provided, especially for some, you know, for a, a kid from the from the suburbs who was just as narrow and bland and unknowing and and limited as he could possibly be. To me, that just looked like the world exploded in a, in a way that was completely intoxicating. Um, and then, you know, as when I went to school and started reading books and studying philosophy and stuff like that, it, it seemed like it exploded again. And uh, So in some ways, I write for myself, you know, for that boy. And wanting and wanting to give other people an opportunity to, to see things suddenly, you know, because to read a novel, often usually you read a novel and, and you kind of know what's going to happen. Oh, this is a mystery novel, or this is that kind of novel, or that kind of novel. But if you read a novel like this one, you go, okay, something happened here. I'm not sure what it was. <laughs> I think I liked it though. You know, I mean, that's what I'm kind of hoping for. I. Um, because that's how I was, you know, when I was a kid, and I was discovering postmodern fiction writers like Donald Barthelme, um, and uh, discovering, uh, you know, hippie music or whatever it was, or discovering classical music when I when I went to uh, San Francisco and listened to Mahler symphonies and things like that. Um, it was it was a way for uh, me to discover uh, that the world had these enormous potentialities that I had no idea. Of. And so I always write for people hoping, and work for people in other ways, uh, hoping that I can make the world go boom for them. And they can sort of say, wow, I can, I, I can think about things in a different way. Uh, and maybe that translates over into our life and into our culture. Boom. <laughs> boom. <laughs> Barbara Hart, which is a work in the